you come to any kind of meditation class for a while, like you, you, it, you just learn <laughs> over and over again how we are all beginners. <laughs> you know, it's that. Um, it's just understanding the nature of the mind is that it's so easy. We've like trained our mind to be really distracted, to multitask. And um, so it's a, it's, it can be a very profound experience to just stop. So in this class, we start by stopping and a physical, some kind of physical stopping. And then you position your body in a way that, um, like you feel internally that there's some space in the body. This might take some effort, you know, sometimes people feel like an effort to just sit upright. But we don't do this in a like, you know, this kind of you know, kind of muscling ourselves into some kind of pose. It really is um, like just this alone is kind of illuminating. Like, oh, I kind of get it. <clears throat> so I'm also a yoga teacher. And I like to remind people, like we're actually doing yoga here. There is kind of a physical pose that you're choosing. And it, it that that pose comes just because you're aware so this is an awareness practice and when we're aware that's when we can see that we're distracted because the nature of distraction is you don't know you're distracted right so we want to see how easy it is for the mind to suddenly jump into the future or jump into the past and how much time we spend you know in these stories about the past these stories of what might happen in the future so when we practice being here so we'll go ahead and we'll start we'll just do what we call our grounding practice i would say like we're you know we're not even meditating yet <laughs> We're just seeing like, wow, what is, there is a little bit of a wow, what happens when I feel that I'm stopping and you might close your eyes. There's kind of different ways that you might feel your way into this. So a sense of being grounded then is a knowing I'm stopping. It might even feel uncomfortable to stop. You know, so we practice putting everything else down and you're knowing like, hmm, what's really weighing on my mind? What's weighing on my heart? What is, the, what is your mind obsessing about today? You just see, like, oh, I see what's going on. But we actually start to physically relax. So when you listen, when you listen with your ears, what sounds do I hear around me? Or when you listen to your body by feeling your body, we naturally have to Quiet. And 
taking some time right now to really tune in and be sensitive. You might notice there's kind of a complexity to this present moment. We might have things in our life that are really going our way. And then there might be things that are not going our way. And this is just kind of human nature. There's, well, in Buddhism, they call it the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows. Yeah, this, this really happens right in this heart. I can allow all of it to kind of coexist. And almost like the, like the heart gets a little bigger. Feeling the base of your body, like what's on the earth? Like taking refuge in the earth, letting the earth really hold you. As we connect to the earth, maybe even deep in your belly, there's this ah, ah, oh, relax my belly. Mm, I can soften and just relax my face. The whole face. So all of this is just little by little, we're releasing our own tension simply by being here. It's a really simple joy of existence. Sometimes we start to just listen to the thinking. And then we remember, oh yeah, I'm practicing. I'm listening to this whole experience, this feeling my body, listening to even sounds around you and or your awareness might kind of roam through your body. How are you doing today? Is there pain? Or is there a feeling like in your body of things kind of flowing and moving? Your heart is beating. Breath is flowing, aware of being. And 
even opening fully like well the world is like this right now we all know in the world there's the 10,000 joys the 10,000 sorrows and my response is to allow this So in this class, then there's a time where we're practicing, we're kind of doing the teachings, but then there's times where we do also just receive, you know, some of all what has been passed down and really passed down with this wish for all beings to be free of tension. So as part of the teachings, I <clears throat> really appreciated last week, Jenny was talking about just like what we were just doing, how we can cultivate both a feeling of being relaxed. You might have even felt this in your body, like a little bit, even that smallest amount kind of, you know, tilts our whole experience to see this is possible. I can choose like I can actually be the cause for my own feeling of peace, at ease with things as they are. Like I can actually be the, the cause of this. I don't have to look externally for someone else, you know, some other solution. It's right here. So we learn that like little by little. And then there's the relaxing and then there's actually the alertness. And so this alertness and um, awareness, kind of heightened awareness is a very moment to moment thing, right? Like the awareness flits away, we, a powerful thought comes in, we start thinking it and like, oh, that's right. I'm practicing putting everything down, I'm not, figuring things out right now. So this only happens in this present moment where we see, oh, am I here? Am I, you know, half here? Can I be fully here? And I can sense I'm fully here because I feel my body. I feel this, oh, I feel the relaxing and I feel the alertness and that, that balance. And then this wish that we have, so this is part of what we're the undertaking here um, is this interest in decreasing stress or tension. And then we have this wish not only for ourselves, but for everyone. May I be the cause for all beings to have less tension? And can I, you know, bring that into the world in a way? But at first there really is this, how can I help myself? This is so important to not overlook this, you know, tension in this heart. So this is, um, I find the really personal experience, like I'm really exploring self-care. And that is a rich part of the beginning of our practice. And so I've been sharing 
when I've been teaching, I've been sharing a little bit from this book by Tony Bernhard. The, it's called How to Be Sick. And she shares a lot about what, what she learned about having chronic illness and how she was um, an attorney and she knows a lot about like pain and suffering, that um, term that's used a lot. Um, like, have you caused someone pain and suffering? And she got really um, specific about it, saying, calling it physical pain and mental suffering. So we, um, she discovered that she was experiencing a lot of physical pain, a lot of physical illness, and that this, these teachings aren't going to do much for that. She said, this is about the mental suffering. That's something I can do something about is what, you know, uh, that I'm creating in my head. Like, I don't like this. And boy, can I whip that up? You know, just this isn't fair. This is, uh, you know, so um, I mentioned this before that she took then years of over and over again that moment of feeling that, why is this happening to me? And then she got like very little answer, even of like what illness she had, like, ah, oh, that I just want to know what I have. And so I can, then I can solve it, you know? Um, so I'm going to share just a little bit from this chapter on, I find it really interesting in Buddhism, there are these, what are called these four um, divine abodes or like beautiful places to dwell. And they are loving kindness or kindness. You could just say kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. And I find it interesting, the one that she starts with in her book is empathetic joy. And that means being happy when someone else is happy. So chapter six is titled, Finding Joy in the Life You Can No Longer Lead. I mean, wow. So she noticed her life changed because of her chronic illness in a way that she learned probably it's not going to return to that, what her life used to be, and how she found joy in the life she could no longer lead. So she starts with a quote by Shunru Suzuki says, we should find perfect existence through imperfect existence. So first, she shares these um, divine abodes, what I just described, four of these. And then she thought, okay, how am I going to do this? You know, and so she shared a little bit about how this is a practice, how some people say we're like apprentices. And she said, I like how the Zen teacher, Robert Aiken, when Whenever he began like a, a, a recitation of the Buddhist precepts, he said, I undertake the practice of. He said, I like these words because it's not about don't do this or always do this and how that can set us up for failure. I won't always succeed in my efforts to cultivate these beautiful dwellings. But I vow to undertake the practice of cultivating them. The practice of what um, the teacher Neem Karoli Baba says, not throwing anyone out of my heart. So cultivating empathetic joy. I am going to read a little bit from this. Without the ability to share others' joy, even just a little, 
I'd be steeped in envy. Because our activities are so limited, and she's talking about um, being limited because her illness kept her bedridden a lot. Because our activities are so limited, it's hard for the chronically ill not to feel overwhelmed by envy for those who are fortunate enough to be able to keep doing the things they always have. Many of us must stay home, unable to join family and friends when they go to a movie or take a bike ride or go to, on vacation or attend a wedding or other major life event. Even those who are not housebound have to pace themselves carefully and cannot always spontaneously visit or go out for a meal with family and friends. These limitations often apply to caregivers too, because they must frequently forego cherished activities, either because their loved ones need care or because the activities aren't enjoyable to engage alone. She says her husband, Tony, so her husband also is named Tony, finds it hard to enjoy weddings and the like without having me there to share the experience with him and to talk together about it afterward. So it's not surprising that envy arises easily in the life of the chronically ill and the caregivers. It can be so overpowering that it feels as if it's eating us alive. And it has sometimes been like that for me. When envy is strong, it drives away any chance of feeling peaceful and serene. In addition, the emotional stress brought on by envy exacerbates our physical symptoms. So it can actually lead to more physical pain. The latter is not surprising. Buddhism understands an emotion to be a thought plus a physical reaction to that thought. Thankfully, empathetic joy can be a powerful antidote to the emotional pain of envy. After becoming ill, it took me a long time to be able to evoke this sublime state of empathetic joy easily. At first, feeling joyful just because others were happy was a sheer act of will. I'd learned that people I knew were going to the Mendocino Coast which used to be a favorite place for Tony and me, and envy would rear its ugly head. I think of this practice and try to feel happy about it, silently saying, it's so nice they'll be able to see the ocean. But I'd be saying it through gritted teeth. It felt like fake joy. I stuck with the practice though, and slowly, 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 fake joy began to turn into genuine joy. Here's a critical point, and it doesn't only apply to empathetic joy, it applies to all of these beautiful states. Their cultivation is not to be looked upon as a pass-fail test. For example, with empathetic joy, if you feel even a bit of joy in the midst of envy, you succeeded and can cultivate that seed, knowing that you're heading in the right direction. So she gives an example about um, how her husband bought two tickets um, for um, him and their granddaughter to go see Fiddler on the Roof. She said, this musical is special to me because it's the story of how my father's family immigrated from modern day Ukraine to the United States in the early 1900s. Fiddler on the Roof was my story and I wanted to be the one to take Malia to see it. As a result, instead of feeling happy about their plans, I felt envy and resentment. I felt like the victim of some in terrible in or I felt like the victim of some terrible injustice because I was too sick to travel. It's not fair, I protested to myself. With effort, I was able to turn my misery around. 
I started by evoking self-compassion for how hard it was not to be able to take Malia to Fiddler. Being kind to myself in this way enabled me to drop the painful stories I was spinning about how unfair life can be. It also made it easier to look at their plans through their eyes and reflect on how they wouldn't want their evening at Fiddler to make me unhappy. Then I turned my attention to feeling empathetic joy. Again, at first I had to pretend, but that's okay. It didn't take long for that pretending to turn into genuine joy as I felt happy just knowing that Malia was going to see a musical that's such an important part of my life. And then something special happened. The joy I was feeling made me feel so connected to them that it felt as if I were part of the evening too. As if the two of them were there for all three of us. So she ends by saying to, to paraphrase that quote of Shunru Suzuki at the beginning of this chapter, Empathetic joy has allowed me to find perfect existence, even though my health is far from perfect. So I know that was kind of a long reading, but I love her story and her example of how challenging it can be to apply these teachings and what we the resistance we can come up against. But I love how when she persist, persisted that that connection she developed was so strong that her energetic connection was there. It didn't matter if her body was there. I find too in this book of how to be sick that even if we're not suffering from a, um, a chronic illness, this helps us in times when we are sick or sick for a long time and how we can be with it. So as we move now into our meditation time, can find a physical position again just that just the effort just the right effort maybe closing your eyes so there is a transformation that like clearly things are not perfect or not everything is going my way nor will it ever. And as I understand that, the heart connects. The body, ah, uh, like stepping into reality. Can this moment This moment, can I free myself of tension? Part of empathetic joy is actually noticing joy in our lives and really opening, seeing the goodness in ourselves. It's a formal practice.
even reflect on maybe there was something you did or said that was kind recently. You see that capacity, that real natural goodness. And let it kind of permeate physically in your body, this, this wish in this moment, may I be free of tension. And in the next breath, may I be free of tension. Aware of the space maybe around your throat, allowing your throat to soften. Or bringing awareness deep into your belly. Just little by little, this moving into a stillness or a what does it feel like to just stop? Imagine a spaciousness even around your eyes or inside, like around your brain. I'm giving myself some space.
as you bring awareness around your heart, like no matter what is happening today as you're practicing that the heart can stay light. Like let's say your mind is really jumpy or bouncy and like, huh. Well, look at that. My mind is all over the place. Or the mind is kind of fuzzy or dull. Like, oh, that's what it feels like today. Maybe it is like, wow, I'm, I'm experiencing my body in a way that I just usually don't. And knowing what it feels like to be embodied. As I bring awareness to my body, it softens. And I'm practicing again and again. So speaking of just seeing the goodness, it's it's good right at the end of our practice to really appreciate just the effort that you brought to your practice today and you might notice how you feel what has shifted it's good that we don't have a real agenda of what we want out of this sometimes what we what happens after we do this work it's like we can't plan that or um like all we know for certain is that it can be of benefit every time you bring awareness back. Um, and then of course, this thing continues outside of class. One of the um, uh, teachers I've definitely been studying from lately, it's Sayadat Utenjaniya. He is so strong on just saying, our practice is, is yes on the cushion, but it's also in the world. Like we don't, it doesn't make sense to not practice right? Like, oh, now I can just be distracted. I can go back to my own normal chaos, you know, and we just see like, oh, just any time where we can bring ourselves back, what we could say, bring back to reality, like, honey, just come back. Don't spin out. Stay grounded. So I want to say just thank you so much, everyone.